What's up, guys? My name is Miles. And my name is Fez. And this is The Commodity. And today we are reacting to The Vanishing of Flight 370. This video was recommended to us through our Discord. If you would like to recommend anything through Discord, go ahead and hop down there now. Uh, yes. I've watched documentaries on this and... I remember when it happened. It hasn't been that long ago. What, like maybe five years ago, something like that? Yeah. Uh, I don't... I mean, it's it, super trippy. It, <laughs> so he knows out of anybody that I deal with anxiety. And uh, when it happened, I flew a lot at the time. I'd always go visit family and stuff like that. And they're far enough to need to fly um, or could fly. I mean, it's like a six hour drive just to visit my parents. But... Uh, I got to the point where I had to have an actual drink before I got on an airplane. Really? Yeah, because, uh, or I would have to fly so early I was going to sleep the whole way. Yeah. Otherwise, my anxiety would be too high because these kind of things, knowing that this still happens, uh, this was tragic. This was huge. It, yeah. I mean, it made it all over the news and it still hasn't been found. You know? Right. And, and that's the crazy part. Now, this video is almost 25 minutes long, so this is going to be kind of a long one. But stick around, guys. This is interesting. We'd love you guys to uh, react with us. So Let's do it. You ready to hop in? Yep. Just let me know. Just let me know. That's a cool channel name. Let Just me know. know. Is that what it is? Yeah. It's 2014. Yeah, so it's been seven years? Yeah. Did you know that all That's pilots speak in only English? International airport. Hmm? Like whenever you're, if you're a pilot, no matter where you are, you, you have, have to, to speak English. English. Really? Yep. I did not know that. A Boeing 777 is preparing for departure. Malaysian T70, request level. T70, we are ready. Requesting flight three five zero to Beijing. Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 is a daily passenger flight between Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia and Beijing, China. 42 minutes past midnight, Flight 370 is given clearance to depart. On board are Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah, First Officer Fariq Abdul Hamid, 10 cabin crew members, and 227 passengers. That's insane. Number control, Malaysian uh, 370. Malaysian 370, Lampo Radar, good morning. Climb flight level 250. Morning, level 250, Malaysian uh, 370. Malaysian 370, climb flight level 350. Climb level 350, Malaysian uh, 370. Less than an hour into the flight, the plane is cruising over the South China Sea at an altitude of 35,000 feet. The night sky is clear and the weather is calm. See, and that's what's so crazy about it is that's what I've heard is it was like a super clear night, no yeah. bad weather, and it just vanished. And I, I, I don't know, we'll probably learn out this, but I think I heard that they said that they're possible like, uh, like somebody shot it down, a government shot it down, a military shot it down or did something. Really? So, yeah, no. I mean, I don't know the truth. I don't know the facts. I, right. I, uh, I haven't heard much of it in a long time. I just, uh, what I remember is they didn't, they never found it. So, yeah. and considering that they all have black boxes and tracking systems and all that kind of stuff. And it's crazy that they aren't able to find anything from it. Yeah. And if anybody watching knows or has family members that were on this flight, our hearts go out to you. Flight 370 is then instructed to signal air traffic control in Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam, as it is about to enter Vietnamese airspace. The flight controller in Kuala Lumpur says goodnight, with no sign that anything should be amiss. Malaysian uh, 370, maintaining level 350. Malaysian 370. Malaysian 370, maintaining level 350. Malaysian 370. Malaysian 370, country Ho Chi Minh 120, decimal 9, uh, good night. Uh, good night, Malaysian uh, 370. And this is where, I where I'm talking, like they all have to speak English because you got to think he's going from Malaysia 
through Vietnam, they said, and then they're going into China. So how many people do you know that speak all three of those languages? Right. Malay, Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese, and then Chinese. That would be the most difficult job in the yeah. world. <laughs> yeah, and once they get out of one airspace, they no longer can contact that airspace. Right, they're and past so, that. Yeah. So that's why I think there was a dead zone that they hit, but I guess we'll find one out. One minute and 43 seconds later, yeah. the aircraft suddenly vanish from radar screens at Kuala Lumpur, Ho Chi Minh, and Bangkok. This form of positional tracking depends on a signal being emitted by one of two transponders aboard a plane, and so its disappearance would suggest both transponders ceased to function, or the system was manually deactivated by someone on board. All subsequent attempts to contact and ascertain the whereabouts of Flight 370 are unsuccessful. The aircraft has seemingly vanished without a trace. After missing its scheduled time of arrival in Beijing some four hours later, Flight 370 is officially declared missing, and in the wake of that announcement, the most expensive search effort in aviation history is about to commence. Wow, that's something I didn't know. Yeah. This is a very well put together video. Yeah. The search was initially concentrated around the location of the flight's disappearance between the South China Sea and the Gulf of Thailand. That's a lot of area The search to area cover. was soon expanded, yeah. however, after the Malaysian military disclosed additional information. Unlike the radar system employed by air traffic control, long-range military radar does not rely on transponders but use reflectance to track the position of aerial targets. A review of the data collected by the Malaysian military revealed that moments of the contact with Flight 370 was lost. The aircraft had deviated from its scheduled yeah. flight path with a subtle turn to the right, followed by a prolonged turn to the left. The aircraft had then flown back towards and across the Malaysian Peninsula before turning right near the island of Penang. See, that's what's super weird. Wow. Like, it completely turned and went a di different direction. Could have been aliens. I'm not trying to it <laughs> minimize it, but I mean, the stuff that's coming out now, you yeah. never know at this point. I don't know if anything has been released to you guys, but uh, the, the government, U the U.S. government is, is releasing un uh, redacted files after file and video after video. And uh, people UFOs are, and yeah, people are coming out and saying that uh, pilots, U.S. pilots are like, we've seen There's so things. many things that we've seen that we are just not haven't been able to talk about it within our grasp of understanding so yeah. i mean i think i think it's more of a hijacking situation than anything it seems yeah. to make more sense i don't know why anybody would have that like what like they, it's not like they send it back into kl and try to take out their twin towers could or have been like somebody that. in there that they were trying to get rid of it maintained That's this true. northwesterly heading until it escaped the radar's coverage. Over the next few days, the Strait of Malacca, the Andaman Sea, and the wow. Bay of Bengal was scoured by a multinational fleet of aircraft and vessels, but there was no trace of Flight 370. Meanwhile, investigators began to analyze the aircraft's satellite communication records. Like all modern airliners, Flight 370 was equipped with a satellite communications terminal, or SATCOM, to send and receive transmissions to and from the ground. Prior to the departure of the SATCOM terminal, they logged on to the honest. satellite network and established a connection with a ground station in Perth, Australia. That station then maintained a detailed record of all the incoming and outgoing traffic between it and Flight 370. This is what it contained. Prior to the flight's disappearance over the South China Sea, everything appeared to be working as intended. Then, at some point during this portion of the flight, the SATCOM link was severed. For whatever reason, the terminal ceased to respond. That's so weird. But three minutes after the flight vanished over the Andaman Sea, the terminal requested to log back onto the network. The SATCOM link was successfully re-established and was not disrupted again until nearly six hours later when the flight is presumed to have crashed due to fuel exhaustion. During these That's final weird. hours, two attempts were made to contact the plane via satellite telephone. Both calls were acknowledged by the SATCOM terminal and would have been routed to the cockpit. Yet, they went unanswered. The terminal had also responded to five automatic status requests. In short, if the ground station had not heard from the aircraft in over an hour, it would transmit a signal to confirm the terminal was still online. 
While these transmissions did not contain any information about the flight's position, investigators were able to measure the distance between the satellite and the aircraft at the time of each transmission, based on how long it took those transmissions to be sent and received. This generated seven rings of possible locations from which seven of these transmissions are thought to have originated. That is such a huge... By taking fuel consumption, yeah. speed, and other factors into account, flight path analysis indicated the most probable origin of the final transmission to be somewhere along this arc in the southern Indian Ocean. The search effort shifted accordingly, and as the region fell within the jurisdiction of Australia, the... Okay, number one, I would have hated to do the research to make this video. Oh, 100%. This is so much information to not just research, but to illustrate and then be able to like write it in a way that's entertaining yeah. or uh, it draws you in. Uh, yeah, to draw you in. Yeah, <clears throat> this is impressive. But so do OK, so this is seven years ago. I really I don't remember. the. So I don't remember what it was like flying seven years ago. Because I do remember, like, the last time I flew was in January, and they had free Wi-Fi on it, and I was actually texting my parents right, the whole entire way. Yeah. Talking, you know, like, what we were planning on doing, because I was just going down to pick up a car. I wasn't going to be able to even say hi or get hugs or anything like that because of COVID. Um, so, I would say that seven years ago, that would have probably been new, fairly newer technology. So right. it probably wasn't on every single plane or anything like that. Because one thing I did notice before I connected to the internet, you have no service whatsoever. Right. So, huh. I, I don't know. Uh, did y'all have Wi-Fi on your airplanes in 2000? What did it say? 2014? Yeah. Yeah. So. The Australian government took charge of the operation. Over the next few weeks, the search area was progressively refined to account for oceanic drift as well as improved wow. estimations of the flight path. That's but so this much part of the southern Indian Ocean this, is so is remote, cool. it took six days just to get there. A new wow. fleet of aircraft and vessels gradually covered more than 4.5 million square kilometers of ocean. Dang. But Flight 370 was nowhere to be found. If the impact with the ocean had been sufficiently forceful, it was possible the resulting sound had been recorded by underwater listening devices known as hydrophones. This are those common, right? <laughs> that seems like uh, especially that far out, like they just intruding said. my intru intruding on my rights. <laughs> Possibility was investigated, and four hydroacoustic monitoring stations had recorded something. While the timing and That's direction creepy. of the sound were reasonably consistent with the final satellite transmission, the estimated origin was not. The sound was in all likelihood caused by nothing more than geological activity. Flight 370 was also equipped with two underwater locator beacons which had a battery life of some 40 days. And as wow. the deadline approached in early April, signals with a pulse and frequency somewhat similar to the signal emitted by the beacons were detected at depths of up to 3,000 meters. An autonomous submersible then spent weeks scanning the seafloor where the signals had been detected, but no wreckage was ever found. That's so weird. So what was the signals coming from then? That's like, they said they had multiple signals. What were they coming from? The sounds no. that you were just talking about? No, I said that they had found signals. Same signals An that... An autonomous oh, submersible that, that, then spent yeah, weeks the, uh, scanning the, the seafloor where the signals had been detected, yeah, many signals, but no wreckage how was, was ever not found. found. Or how was nothing found? And nothing would be found until more than 16 months later, when a discovery was made on the opposite side of the Indian Ocean. On the 29th of July 2015, a group of people were cleaning up a beach in Reunion, a small island to the east of Madagascar, when they stumbled upon this two meter long metallic object covered hmm. in barnacles. Aviation experts quickly identified the object as a section of an aircraft wing known as a flaperon. Upon closer inspection, like a made internal name. markings, yeah. including dates and serial numbers, conclusively ascertained the flaperon wow. belonged to Flight 370. 
even though Reunion Island is some 4,000 kilometers west of the search area, and more than a year had gone by since the flight disappeared, the location was consistent with simulations of debris dispersal patterns. There was now tangible evidence that Flight 370 had crashed somewhere. That is so much, like looking at this picture, you're like, oh, that's not too far. But then you got to realize, I think that's Australia and Africa. So it's hugely far away. Yeah. So you literally have tens of thousands of miles, but you have a general idea of where it would have traveled now that you found one piece. Mm -hmm. However, I mean, it could have been completely destroyed. Well, yeah, and it shows the water patterns too, how they, how everything goes. Yeah, I mean, no, yeah, they everywhere. know all this stuff. This is like some very basic, and I bet you they had this stuff from World War II or something like that. Yeah. It's just crazy. In the Indian Ocean. The discovery of the flapper arm prompted numerous searches along beaches and shorelines of southeastern Africa, and at least wow. 31 additional items mm. of interest have since been recovered and examined. Some of these items include a section of the outboard flap from the right wing, a piece of cowling from one of the two engines. Oh, wow. South Africa. A partial door from the nose landing gear. Damn. Madagascar. A section of the vertical stabilizer. And a mangled oh, casing beak. from one of the embedded headrest monitors. That's so insane. 18 of these items were identified as either likely, highly likely, or almost certain to have originated from Flight 370, whereas only three could be confirmed. The remaining 11 could not be identified. At that point, it's enough to be confirmed. And, well, you know, it was minimally, you know, at least a wreck. Maybe uh, someone saw it and they took it down. I mean, there's still so many possibilities. Yeah. There were no traces of an explosion. But it's all at the beginning of the, the crazy tested, yeah. nor was there any evidence of a fire except for three small burn marks on one of the unidentifiable items. The search for debris was further aided by Earth observation satellites. Analyses of satellite imagery from March of 2014 uncovered a number of images which appeared to feature man-made objects floating on or just it's below the surface that in the southern yeah. Indian Ocean. However, the images were not nearly sharp enough to resolve any identifiable markings, and multiple searches notwithstanding, this debris was never recovered. A satellite image taken mere hours after the final transmission also captured what appeared to be a contrail some distance away from the search area. A later analysis, however, concluded it was most likely a shadow from a somewhat linear cloud formation. The underwater portion of the search continued for months and eventually years before it was finally suspended in early 2017, by which point some 120,000 square kilometers of seabed had been scrutinized. The search effort was then resumed by an American salvage company known as Ocean Infinity, but after more than a year of searching, they too came up empty-handed. So Unless the final resting place of, of Flight searching. 370 can be located... I think at this point there would be enough corrosion and enough like affected affection affection uh it would be affected so drastically from the ocean waves and water and sand, salt and all that so whatever was like salvageable or like, something that you could actually find of of value would, could have been completely destroyed right but the hole should still be there not necessarily Depends on how hard it hit. I mean, unless it just completely exploded or something like that. Which could have possibly... Yeah. Based on the... See, and we're just... And right now, you're just kind of looking at the end point of where it went down. Mm -hmm. All the crap that could have happened when it just randomly decided to go in the complete opposite direction of where it was supposed to go. Yeah. That's the crazy part. Like, I mean, it's all speculation. Like... Did somebody hijack the plane? Well, they did a horrible job. Take it from America. Um, did, I mean, and they they knew the plane well enough to shut off the, any of this, the sensors. If it was to hijacked, be yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's on another level. Because even when the U.S. planes, the ones that hit the World Trade Centers, they didn't, like, try to hide it. Right. They just came in and did it. And... I don't know why anybody else would do it any other way. Um, 
Unless somebody was running yeah, from the government. But then again, they wouldn't know that kind of stuff on a plane. Right. I wouldn't. I mean, if you know that, then you also know that you only have a certain amount of fuel. And you also know how to fly the plane. You also know how, I mean, you're not dumb. Let me put yeah. it that way. Um, That's why I don't think it was a hijack. Yeah, unless I don't think it was a hijack either. Someone. Unless, unless somehow there was like interception from another government of with a fighter jet that doesn't get you know picked up on radar very easily or whatever the case may be because they're reading the radar but it's only showing that plane right so that's my only thing is like somebody wanted to take it and they made it fly in a different direction or they were making a statement which they obviously failed at they just killed a bunch of people unfortunately yeah so that's where i'm more like like the end was going to happen based off of the circumstances. Right. It's the the beginning of when things started changing. That's what's confusing. That's what's crazy. And that's why I know, I know it sounds stupid and ignorant and rude and, you know, doesn't make sense. I'm not going to say it, but you know what I'm saying. Mm-mm. Extraterrestrial. I mean, that's... Oh, the, that, I mean... I mean, yeah, I mean, it could be anything at this point. I mean, nothing, nothing logical sounds right. Right. So it may illogical be impossible to determine yeah. exactly why it crashed. Nevertheless, there have been no shortage of theories. On the day of the disappearance, two of the passengers raised suspicion as they had boarded the flight with stolen passports, mm -hmm. which immediately prompted help. concerns of a hijacking. But investigators were unable to link the two men to any terrorist organizations and soon determined they had traveled under false identities because they were seeking asylum, not due to any nefarious intent. Similar suspicions were raised when one of the passengers were identified as a flight engineer who might have possessed the necessary expertise to take control of a Boeing 777. Hmm. Apart from the 239 persons on board, Flight 370 carried nearly 11 metric tons of cargo. Wow. Among the items listed on the flight manifest was a shipment of lithium-ion batteries, which led some to suspect a fire might have broken out mid-flight. For instance, the crash of UPS Airlines Flight 6 in September of 2010 was the result of a fire that was ignited by a pallet of lithium-ion batteries. But they didn't just Another randomly go off of... potential source of ignition would be an electrical malfunction. The crash of Swiss Air Flight 111 in September of 1998 is thought to have been caused by a fire within the electrical wiring above the cockpit. The fire damaged and disabled multiple avionic systems, including the transponders and SATCOM. In the case of Flight 370, the sub... So, if it was that, to me, I could understand them going back. Right. Like, if there was a fire started or something like that, it was something major, you go back. Even if their power, their systems go down to the point where they can't see where they're at, you get low enough. I, I, I'm talking out my butt right now. I, I'm not a pilot. I've never been a pilot. I don't know what they would do. But even if all their systems went down and they're able to turn around, the second you see land and let's say things started going wrong, I would think that would be the place that you find somewhere flat yeah. to land. Like yeah. a, a field, a rice field. That'd probably be one of the best fields or anything like that. Big, long, green pasture or something yeah. where you can land it down. Sudden loss of communication and subsequent yeah. deviation from a scheduled everybody. flight path might have been a direct response to a fire. The two pilots may have turned back towards Malaysia to attempt an emergency landing at the nearest suitable airport. But no such attempt was ever made. Instead, Flight 370 kept going and remained aloft for another six hours. So that's the thing. Something Some couldn't have been wrong as a fire standpoint because they had that entire landmass. Yeah, there was, a, there was a place to land within there. Exactly. So it's not like they turned around because uh, the crew they might have been incapacitated by a sudden yeah. or gradual loss of cabin pressure. For instance, when Helios Airways Flight 522 failed to pressurize in August of 2005, the pilots quickly fell unconscious. Yet the aircraft continued to fly on autopilot for more than two hours until it ran out of fuel. 
Airline pilots are of course trained for such an event. In the event of cabin depressurization, an automatic system is designed to deploy oxygen masks to give the pilots enough time to perform an emergency descent to a more breathable altitude. Mm -hmm. The data recorded it by the Malaysian like military seconds, radar too. does yeah. indeed contain altitude information, but it is highly inconsistent. In fact, a Boeing 777 is incapable of performing the extreme altitude fluctuations recorded. At one point, the aircraft ah. exceeded its maximum operating altitude by more than 15,000 feet wow. before making oh. a 50,000 feet nosedive in less than a minute. Attempts to recreate these maneuvers on a flight simulator were unsuccessful, and thus the data was deemed inaccurate and unreliable. If Flight 370 did lose cabin pressure at 35,000 feet and the pilots were incapacitated before descending to a more oxygenated altitude, it might explain why the aircraft remained aloft for as long as it did. What is a bit more difficult to explain, however, are these alterations in heading. Yeah. Flight simulations have established the aircraft must have been under manual control during the initial left turn as the bank angle or inclination of that turn was beyond the limits of the autopilot. Subsequent turns, however, could have been either manual or automatic. But for the autopilot to have made these course corrections, someone with the requisite knowledge must have programmed it to do so. The only other alternative is that the aircraft was in fact under manual control. Where were you going? In late June of 2014, several news outlets reported that a special investigation had identified the captain of Flight 370 as a prime suspect. A wow. search of the captain's home had uncovered a flight simulator which supposedly contained a suspicious route which ended in the southern Indian Ocean. At the time, there was no official acknowledgement that such a route had been recovered Suicide. Mass, like, I'm angry at the world type situation. Yeah. And I'm assuming a pilot would have a general idea of how to disconnect certain things. Especially if uh, he had access to some type of documentation or way to do so. He may have asked some local, somebody that is a mechanic. I mean, there's, I, I didn't even think about the pilot and pilot being suicidal i'm sure the job is stressful but that life sucks could have been though bad. with all the uh news publishing is coming out and everything like he's not there to defend himself and his yeah. family's having to deal with it and that sucks yeah that's the worst it, part if it wasn't him you know and it's just everybody's dog in the family now and it was it was you i watched the ted bundy thing with right probably and how the family had to the parents had to live with it yeah and it's like how do you defend what somebody in your family does? It's unfair. Right. But you're always going to get that scrutiny. It's just... It's, but, but the thing is, I mean, he's not even there to defend himself. And he might... I mean... He, yeah, he may have been completely... Yeah. Innocent. And that's yeah. the thing. You are... If I... Let's say you were my father and I go do something crazy and then I die. And now you are the one that has to hope and that's you know and that sucks for you on two different levels you're defending me you don't know if it if it, i'm worth defending but at the same time you're hoping yeah that i didn't do something stupid exactly. and if i did something stupid i mean that that's oh it's a bad situation. that's the worst situation. in a lengthy yeah. public report issued i'd rather have any other situation than made no mention doing such something like this then in 2016 Confidential documents pertaining to a forensic examination conducted by the Royal Malaysia Police in May of 2014 was leaked to the media. These documents made it clear that such a route had not only been recovered, but thoroughly examined. Soon thereafter, the Malaysian government confirmed the existence of this simulated flight path, and this is what it looks like. It should come as no surprise that many regard this as damning evidence of premeditation. But according to investigators, it is not quite so evident. The data recovered consists of seven coordinates. Two in Kuala Lumpur, two in the Strait of Malacca, one in the Bay of Bengal, and two in the Southern Indian Ocean. The data was reconstructed from a file that had been automatically generated and saved by the simulation software a month before the incident. 
However, it's not clear whether the coordinates originate from the same flight session. In other words, it might not be correct to simply trace a continuous line between these seven coordinates, as they could be from separate sessions. The forensic examination by the Royal Malaysia Police simply concluded, no activity captured conclusively indicate any kind of premeditated act pertaining to the incident of MH370. Even so, the similarities between the simulated route and the presumed route of Flight 370 directly influenced the search operation. That is really Australian odd. investigators yeah, considered the possibility of someone deliberately extending Very. the range of the flight by gliding the aircraft off the fuel exhaustion. If so, the plane could have traveled an additional 200 kilometers. Alternatively, the range could have been reduced by a controlled ditching prior to fuel exhaustion. While ultimately deemed unlikely, these two scenarios did affect the search effort. If the captain steered Flight 370 off course with the intention of crashing in a remote part of the southern Indian Ocean, his motive is an even greater mystery. Yeah. Sahari Ahmad Shah was 53 and married with three children. He had more than 18,000 hours of flight experience and a spotless track record. Investigators found no evidence of financial issues and his monthly expenses before the disappearance indicated nothing unusual. He had no history of mental illness nor had he displayed any recent changes in lifestyle or behavior. He was raised on the island of Penang, which has led some to speculate the flight's second turn to the southwest of Penang was the captain getting a final view of his hometown. And that's what I heard in a documentary as well, like it was a suicide mission and uh, that's why he went back was so he could fly by his home island to say goodbye, you know. I don't want to, I mean, I, I could see that argument. Yeah, I'm not, gonna, everything, I'm not going to speculate. It's all, it's all speculation. Everything is so convenient at this situation. Right. Like you can point fingers at anybody. Yeah. And the fact that he has the knowledge, possibly has the knowledge of how to disable certain parts of the air plane and know how to fly it and know what's going to happen it's just it's crazy yeah because i think i think there was a kid that uh, that stole a plane like a few years ago here in the u.s i haven't and, heard about that yeah and he committed suicide through that really yeah and i don't know if that was fake or i don't remember but he was like you're just sorry i'm you're gonna have one less plane Took wow. it down and killed himself. Like, there's ways of, I mean. It's just a weird situation. Yeah, it's, it's awful. Some believe a hijacking could have been politically motivated as Sahari was an avid supporter of a democratic opposition leader who was sentenced to five years in prison mere hours before Flight 370 took off. Mm. Others point to unconfirmed reports of marital issues, but this is contradicted by the official investigation and disputed by family members. The only real inconsistency noted by the final report is that the captain failed to repeat the assigned radio frequency during the last verbal communication. Malaysian 370, country Kuchi Mil 120, decimal 9, uh, good night. Uh, good night, Malaysian uh, 370. It would have been standard procedure to repeat the assigned frequency as the captain had correctly done a few minutes prior. Hmm. 370, contact Lampo Radar 1326, good night. Whether this omission is indicative of anything but a mistake is anyone's best guess. By all accounts, Captain Sahari was an affable and well-respected pilot who was passionate about aviation as evident by the photos and videos he shared on social media. Hi everyone, uh, this is a YouTube video that I've made um, as a community uh, service. The co-pilot was found to be even less conspicuous. Farik Abdul Hamid was only 27 and due to marry a fellow pilot. He had nearly 3,000 hours of flight experience, although only 39 hours in this type of aircraft. Much like Zahari, Farik had no financial, mental or interpersonal issues of note, nor was there any evidence of conflict between the two of them. Some questioned the plausibility of a pilot-instigated hijacking due to the apparent lack of interference by the other pilot. Well, when Ethiopian Airlines Flight 702 was hijacked by the co-pilot in February of 2014, he did so by merely waiting for the captain to take a bathroom break before locking the cockpit door behind him. Wow. The co-pilot was then free to divert the Italy-bound flight to Switzerland to seek asylum. 
The only noteworthy piece of evidence in regards to the co-pilot of Flight 370 is his phone. You see, when the confidential documents were leaked, they also confirmed another long-circulated rumor, namely that a cell phone tower had briefly established a connection with an iPhone 5S belonging to the co-pilot as Flight 370 approached the island of Penang. That's odd as well. You know, that means you're thing. low enough. Right, and that's the thing, like you've got... I would imagine they have Wi-Fi. Maybe not. I don't know. I mean, I can barely remember yesterday, let alone the technology that was used in 2014. Well, they had the iPhone 5S. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Well, the 5S is... I, I don't think it's even, like, still serviced. Like, it's still can be used. I think the 6S is the last one, so... Ah. Uh, yeah. And that was four, three generations ago, four generations, or four... Yeah, you still, three, had, like you ago. said, though, had to be low enough to be able to... According to signal. investigators, it was not a phone call, as has been widely reported by the media, but merely an automatic location signal. Why this information was omitted from public reports, we may never know. So what is one to make of all of this? On the one hand, the simulated flight path seems suspicious. On the other, it is difficult to cast any substantial doubt on either of the two pilots' character. It is equally difficult to deny a hijacking is consistent with the available evidence. Then again, we're missing some quite major and literal pieces of evidence. The final report issued by the Malaysian government in 2018 could not attribute the loss of communication nor diversion of Flight 370 to a malfunction. Instead, it is believed that someone manually manipulated the aircraft because it and has its two of those. For things. instance, investigators believe SATCOM so was manually disabled by a sudden no, not, and not by interruption error. of power. Not then, by once power failure. was restored, the terminal simply rebooted. Likewise, the alterations in heading are believed to be the result of manual inputs. With that being said, the uncertainty of these findings are repeatedly emphasized due to the limited evidence available, and the report does never explicitly state the flight was hijacked. In fact, no real conclusion is reached. Both the Malaysian and Australian government agree that Flight 370 crashed in the southern Indian Ocean, but that the cause is indeterminable without the wreckage, the location of which has managed to elude some of the foremost aviation experts in the world as well as an impressive arsenal of cutting-edge technology for more than half a decade. It's Authors, insane. aviation experts, and, and could you imagine like all the the boats that have gone through the ocean since yeah. then? Like, and their radars haven't detected anything, or sonars haven't detected anything. I wonder if any government, like U.S. government or uh, like Australian government, Malaysian government, uh, like Navy ships have some technology that they didn't use that could have probably, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it would matter. Right. But, I mean, I would guess that they have some technology that would be able to find something a little bit better than just a boat that's searching. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like echolocation in type stuff. I mean, right. Independent. Well, that's why I was saying, like, sonar. Like, yeah. All the boats that have went through, how have they not the investigators seen it? Yeah. have all chimed in to offer their own thoughts and theories as to the nature of the crash and the location of the wreckage. Some believe there was no crash, but that the aircraft was shot down by an American naval base in the middle of the Indian Ocean. The satellite transmissions were then supposedly forged as part of a massive cover up. Hmm. Others believe the aircraft turned right towards India and traveled as far north as Kazakhstan, completely undetected. Debris was then supposedly planted along shorelines of southeastern Africa as part of a massive cover-up. Another That's theory suggests the aircraft was remotely hijacked and controlled by someone on the ground. While Boeing and other companies have experimented with technology that would allow for an aircraft to be remotely controlled, no commercial airliner is known to be outfitted with such a system. That would be freaking... In 2014, on top of that. On the less conspiratorial side, the assumption that Flight 370 flew in a straight line and at a constant speed after turning left towards the southern Indian Ocean might simply be incorrect. In early 2018, a French team of independent investigators proposed an alternate flight path, whereby an attempted landing on Christmas Island led to a crash site much further north 
than the region identified by the official investigation. While a surface search of this area was conducted about a week after the disappearance, the underwater phase never reached this far north. Hmm. So that could be the spot. As of the making of this video, the search operation has been suspended, but there have been talks of potentially resuming the search. That would be cool to see, like, they resume the search and search, like, the Christmas Island area. Um, but that's super trippy. I wonder how much, and it doesn't matter, but I'm curious to how much money they spent during the, for, uh, in, to search. Right. Yeah, because they said it was the most expensive aviation uh, rescue search mission in had. history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's insane. Yeah. I've, I've, like I said, I've watched plenty of documentaries on this, and I have not. No one. Had, I mean, obviously, they haven't found it, so you can't have like a. No one has any idea. I mean, they have ideas, but they're all speculation, and that's what's insane. But I hope you guys enjoyed this. It was um, a long one for sure. Yeah. Um, but. I mean, if, okay, without hurting anybody's feelings, what would be your conclusion? Like, if you had to make the decision on how, what happened, what would be your conclusion? I'll tell you mine up front. I, and I hate doing this because you don't know if it's true. My only conclusion is it was a suicide and you took a lot of people with you because you never know what's going through somebody's head that doesn't talk about it. Right. Because... You know, people act normal and happy and everything. And if they don't say anything, you don't know what's going through their head. And they could have gotten in with the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And they were like, I would rather die than them. If, if I die, then they can't hurt my family or whatever the case might be. So you don't know what his situation was. However, based off of the information that I was given, if I had to make an assumption which I would never do that on purpose, is that it would have been my guess, is it was a suicide. I would say possibly somebody hijacked it that was a passenger uh, because they were ordered to get rid of another passenger. That's a super smart passenger. And they just took the plane. But they knew how to turn off all the stuff. They made the pilot do it. You think the pilots would do that? He had them at gunpoint. Everybody's going to die either way. Maybe. What's your what's your thoughts? Put it yeah. down in the comments below. And with that being said, my name is Miles. And my name is Fez. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace. Out.